how to engage students in classes um, in a setting similar to what we have today. And you guys have been tremendously willing to uh, show us into your living rooms and your office spaces. My experience interacting with students online is that the cameras are often off. So a lot of comments were about how do you teach when you don't have visual cues? And that's an, that was one question. And I'd like to maybe kick off with Cloda. Do you have any thoughts on that one? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, I keep saying being human is important, but I think, you know, Pram's point about modeling is quite important here. So I think, you know, I always had ground rules for my lectures when they were face to face about, you know, don't come in 15 minutes late and things like that. And I think setting some ground rules from the beginning about encouraging them at the very least to use their real name, even if they're not going to shoot, show their faces on a camera. Um, but yet you just have to do it over and over again. And, you know, remember, they're going to be doing this in all their courses. So they may actually get more used to engaging online um, than we think they will. But it, it is difficult. I think the more interesting the activity, so the more it relates to their real world. So, you know, again, recognizing that they may be all over the world. So letting them do things like Pram's map or my, what happens with railways in your country may help them at least sort of realize this is relevant to me and it's worth me getting involved with it. Okay, great. Um, uh, what about, so other questions that came up again about synchronous sessions, which is what I want to focus on, on in this part, is about how do we plan activities that are new, that we haven't really, we don't have any experience using this medium. And as we saw in the breakout rooms, so we had many breakout rooms and there was a function that I didn't know where you can ask the host for help. And I kept getting these pings saying, uh, we need some help in breakout room like 37. And I was like yo-yoing in between a bit. Um, I didn't even know that existed until this moment. So I guess the question is we're gonna be um, doing something completely new and maybe group activities will require breakout rooms. How many of you guys, uh, I mean, I'm just worried that instead of talking about the question, you talked about what it's like being a breakout room. And in many of the breakout rooms I entered, it was all about, oh, look at this breakout room, you know, that kind of thing. How much time do you think we should schedule for an activity in a breakout room? And then how should the teacher engage in that setting? Parama, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I was thinking that was uh, interesting that in our, in the breakout room I was in, we kind of jumped straight into talking about the issues we're facing for next year. And that might be because people are used to using the breakout rooms. But as someone who's been using a lot of online teaching or blended learning, I guess, for my in-person classes for a long time, I found that students are actually quite forgiving. Um, and it's important to make sure that you don't freak out. So practicing is, is good. So modeling, and modeling is all about what I'm about today, I guess. Um, you know, there's a technical hitch. It's a little bit of an issue, no problem. Have a contingency plan. Uh, but then usually what has happened, maybe I've just been lucky with this, it's first time we've needed a little bit of time to make sure everyone knows how to come in, where to go, any sort of uh, major issues or whatever. And then students really get the, the sort of, uh, understand it very quickly. But this is another reason why I tend to go with sort of maybe less sexy softwares, which are easier to use. So that don't spend a lot of time faffing around with that kind of stuff, because that's what it's not about, the technology. I mean, as someone who uses a lot of technology, I you know, want to sort of highlight that it's not about the, the technology. The other thing is I make a lot of little sort of whiteboard videos and things like that, um, problem set answers and things like that. I make mistakes all the time, and then I'll go back and sort of cancel something that I did and then redo it. Students, A, don't really care that you made the mistake. I don't know whether they notice it. I've never had any complaints. But also that's what brings the human element that it's, you're not a robot. It, it's not professionally done. You're still their teacher, the same person who sometimes messes up in class, right? Um, and there's no reason why this should be different. Great. I do have a thought on that as well with, with breakout rooms. Hmm. I think it does help if somebody feeds back to the group as a whole. So there is a mission to it. <laughs> So you do have the discussions, you know each other, maybe to start with, there are smaller groups and, and people get accustomed to, to how it operates, how these breakup rooms work. But then there is a task to it and, and you feed back to the group as a whole. 
I did feel myself like I, I do want to tell you the interesting things that we've talked about in, in those breakup rooms. So we might write about this, but having a forum to, to feedback, I think it's, it's giving structure to the discussion. Great. Which leads me on to another issue, which is creating a sense of community. So we don't focus so much on creating a sense of community amongst our students because they kind of organically get to meet each other, but in a world where they don't meet, um, suddenly maybe these discussion platforms will be more important. So maybe for John and Lily, uh, starting with John, what, how are you thinking about trying to create some, I don't know, module identity or something like that? Are you, are you, have you thought about that? Um, I, it, I think it's the biggest challenge in the whole thing, uh, to be honest. Um, I think what I will, what I think it came upon the discussion uh, for the Zoom chat, um, and I mentioned it slightly, is that, that there are two things that I probably will use in Piazza that I didn't, because I only started using it 12 months ago, so I'm, I'm learning on it all the time. The first one is, I think you'd mentioned it, that there's a, a Q&A session. So I think for me, when I, I, I really want to use that as a sort of a structure. So there's some asynchronous stuff. And now we're going to have a, a set timetable Q and A session on Piazza that I expect you to, um, you know, to to be online uh, uh, and to contribute to, um, because I'm very, I'm very conscious that if it's all if it's very asynchronous, which is great for flexibility, but I, I'm not sure under if you give undergraduates too much flexibility, I'm just a bit worried about it. I think it it needs little structured points in it and those structured synchronous sessions are where you try and get that sort of team that sort of course identity going as much as you can so i think i probably will try and use that q a because it's synchronous and actually have you know I, i'll have set timetable q a sessions where we, we we sort of chat whatever technology whatever in interaction that you that you use but i think they're going to be extremely i think if you just if you're if 90 percent of it is asynchronous i just think it'd be very difficult to get a sort of a community or a course identity going hmm. lily do you have any thoughts I, I think that in most cases we are talking about both so synchronous and asynchronous activities but there's also a lot of talk about blended learning so there would be potentially, that's the way to, to use uh, the face-to-face -face real meetings where, where you do know people. Don't use it for, for teaching any particular topic. It's just about meeting people. And then you're, you're breaking out in, in these groups where you have an idea with who you're working. But certainly I think the most important is to, to have icebreaker type of activities. Come easy at people. Don't, don't start with, with difficult stuff or difficult questions because that way, People will feel more comfortable again if, if there are little groups with which you are working mingle them as well from time to time don't get them stuck with, with the same people so th there is a little bit of, of creative thinking really there as well great thanks just to say that um at lse we usually have classes staggered so you have the lecture one week and then the class is the following week so there's always a time lag so in week one there's no class we're going to introduce one just so that people can meet each other on on zoom which is the platform we're going to be using uh, for our synchronous teaching. So kind of, it, you know, adding just one that doesn't have, it's sort of like a, maybe setting the rules of engagement, how are they expected to behave in this new environment? So if there's a, a scope for something like that, maybe it would be, it would be useful. Um, but, you know, as I, I agree with every, all the comments about, you know, having scaffolding, getting people to do things. A question that came up, which I don't know the answer to, which would be really great if someone knew the answer was, a lot of our courses involve teaching things relating to mathematics. Many of my colleagues and class teachers are saying, how am I going to go through uh, maths? Oh, Parama, you've raised your hand. I, 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 go, um, interrupt me, go, go for it. I didn't see that, sorry. Thanks very much. I am one of those people who will actually um, click through everything there is to click on. No, no, that was really a, a raised hand. Um, I was just going to say, going back to the, the question that we were talking about before, I think asynchronous things, it's important to have a time element to them as well. So they don't have to be synchronous, but I think in quota section we talked about sort of releasing the material for each topic uh, in, a, in a timely fashion. So it feels like you're in a class, you know, this is your weekly class or whatever it is. Scheduling, I mean, I schedule sort of off live office hours on discussion forums all the time. I'll be here from nine to 10, whatever it is. You can post your questions at any time, obviously, but uh, you know, if you want to be there in real time, do that as well. 
Uh, and I think it really, you know, I have noticed that students tend to be on there at that time, and you know, they appreciate that. Um, in response to your other question, it's it's a really sort of tricky one, and um, you know, I, I'm I'm not sure exactly. I mean, this depends a little bit on sort of university regulations, right? So, what are we expected to do? What's the minimum we can do? and what we prefer to do. I mean, we can talk quite a bit afterwards about uh, what we've decided to do at UCL, which might be different from what other people have um, decided to do. Uh, but yeah, we can come back to that. Great, thank you. Um, uh, for those with iPads, um, I've been told notability is fantastic. It's just that not all our class teachers would have an iPad and in the current universe, we're not gonna be maybe being able to pay for iPads for everybody. So Fabio has a great, uh, idea there just to, to going back to basics pen and paper and webcam i like it i like it uh, sorry um Dimitri, i was also going to add uh, that in the the guide that we have the ctl guide that um claude showed at the beginning we start with literally what's the lowest tech thing you can do balance your phone on something and write under it all the way to if you're going to be super fancy here's what you can do and there's a lot of choices uh, some are less expensive than others and so on um, but I think this the summer is the time to really try all of them out. And I mean, believe me, I've tried them out and I really thought that I was okay writing on the iPad and everything. And then I did pen and paper with uh, uh, my web, you know, my, my phone balanced over it. And was like, I'm never leaving this again. This is all I'm always going to do. Is there even, I mean, I'm sure there's something you can buy for your iPad that's essentially a pad that you connect to your iPad because this has become so you something you can write on with a proper pen and it connects into your iPad. But I think, I mean, we've got a maths lecturer who up to now refused to use a visualizer, would only write ideally on a blackboard, but we've moved him to a whiteboard. Um, so, you know, you have to work with what you're starting with, I think. Um, in these things. We have talked about people actually going into campus and to be allowed to use the lecture cast to record their lecture, their, their snips for the asynchronous. So we're waiting to see if that might be possible at some point in the summer. Um, but, you know, again, going back to what loads of school teachers are doing, a lot of it is either um, portable visualizers, you can get a portable visualizer at home, or, you know, get somebody behind you recording you writing on a piece of paper. Um, it's not perfect, but then having, you know, somebody writing on a whiteboard in the screen of room of 500 people where you can't see the whiteboard isn't perfect either. Cool. Um, in the last couple of minutes, I wanted to ask Mike, who was helping a great deal in the chat, if you're still around, if you could give some thoughts, because I might, and then afterwards, um, Edward, the, um, who put together a lot of the some of the asynchronous material we asked you to have a look at before joining the session do you have any thoughts to share uh, mike if you could um i think i think we've made lots of progress on all the chat i think has been really really useful around this and all this sharing of information on the on the chat has been incredible actually and there's a few things i've learned today in terms of sharing some things um, reminded that poll everywhere is a pretty good way to uh, ask questions and things um, I'm lucky enough to have an iPad and I find that incredibly useful to, to draw and to write the maths out and to do graphs. I think the points around um, making mistakes actually is really, really valuable. Um, I think even, even if you're making mistakes on, on the videos and then you can go back and you correct them in, on those videos for students to see, I think that's really valuable. Um, and I think we need to be really, really careful about going and making ourselves too slick and like a Netflix documentary. And I think we need to make sure that students are learning uh, and that they see, see us as human beings and that we get that, that interpersonal relationship. I think, I think we can get personal relationships through video, but we just need to make sure uh, that we have certain points to enter with, with synchronous um with synchronous material and talk to students and i think teams and small groups are really going to be really important around that um but i think we all have to do what we think works best for us and what we think works best for our modules um so i don't i don't think there's optimal i noted alvin asked about what's the optimal amount of asynchronous material synchronous material i think you have to make that decision you also have to be ready to change two weeks into the semester and go actually what i've decided to do that's not working at the moment. How can I alter that approach a little bit to get it to work better? 
uh, we're all going to be learning in this process and I think if we sell that to students and, and we talk to students like human beings they'll accept that from us. I think yeah. that's it really. Brilliant thanks thanks Mike. Um, 